Welcome and thank you for joining us today to discuss revolutionary technologies and sustainability. My name is Maria and I work as, a D as, as an ESG and sustainability lead at the blockchain company called Concordium. And together with Bianca Lopez, I'm going to be guiding the conversation today. Bianca, thank you so much for joining us. I know you have a lot of experience working in tech and also in the intersection with climate. So I'm so grateful that you're here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you all for joining us today. We will be guiding the conversation for about 40 minutes of time. Um, we already received a bunch of questions for all of you guys uh, joining us. Um, if you do have any questions during the session, please feel free to post them. We have a Telegram chat that you can put them into. Um, but otherwise, we will do our best to go through all of the materials that we have planned. I got to say, as an ESG and sustainability expert, it's like a potpourri of different topics that are happening in that field, um, but we're hoping to get through most of it within the 40 minutes. And in 45 minutes, we'll try to get through a lot of the basic topics and there's a lot to cover, but what surprises, surprises was actually who's here. You all standing there, over 1600 people signed up for this webinar today, which we are both very humbled and excited. What we were surprised is that a lot of you said you didn't have so much experience on the topic, which reminded us all that we are just learning and that's gonna be the vibe. And if that wasn't enough, you're over 23 countries. As you can see on the image here, you're from all over the world. And if that wasn't enough, you're from different industries. We have joined together here different le levels of journalists, academia. We have universities, governing bodies, sustainability studios, finance, energy, manufacturing, fashion. So this just showed us that the topic is just the beginning. And I'm thinking the topic. Mm -hmm. is actually one that I'm so grateful that you're here uh, to guide with me because you have quite a lot of experience in the space of technology and ESG. I know you sit up on the UNESCO uh, Global Council on ESG and AI, which yep. is one of the technologies that we'll be exploring. But could you maybe put some words around, like of all the things that you're seeing in this industry, what is the most interesting to you of the technologies igniting the green transition? I think number one is the awareness like there's no shortage of technologies and i think we're going to cover and kind of realize this today as an identity expert i tend to just always fall in my beloved corner of the finite understanding that identifying things whether they're carbon measures people crops and many other things we're going to cover today identity technology has come up with a really big need as a foundation for this energy transition and offset to start. And as you know, working here at Concordium, like obviously this brings up the topic of interoperability. How has it been for you? Well, it's been really interesting. I started here about a year and a half ago and yeah. we've sort of been unfolding the different areas one by one. But what you sort of slowly realize is that they're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. So whereas we might talk about, you know, energy as one area or ESG reporting as another or carbon markets, they all really reinforce each other, which I think is one of the interesting ones. And we asked you some question prior to, uh, to the event today. And I think the way that the votes have been casted sort of also shows that it doesn't really matter what industry that we're in, we're still pretty much involved in any energy solutions or ESG reporting metrics. That's for a lot of the com companies in the world, but then also carbon credits and supply chains. So they're it's not these fragments anymore. I do talk about them as fragments, but they all sort of reinforce each other in one way or another. And that leads us to the topic around traceability, right? Yes. And how do we move from, you know, we're gonna try to cover these with you during the day and during the time and hear from experts, but traceability is at the core of how this all weaves and intersects. How, has, how have you seen the industry recognize this? Well, I think one of the first things we really saw, at least for the blockchain industry, was that it's, it's this virtual machine that is shared by everyone who's part of the network, which means that everyone sort of have access to whatever is being written to the blockchain at any given point. And one of the first industry that really came up was traceability. And we saw a lot of traditional ways of doing traceability. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was supply chain track and trace. I think some of the first solution, at least in this industry, was 
how can you trace your coffee from the coffee farmers all the way through distribution, all the way through the sales. Mm -hmm. You saw it in the mining industry as well. Yeah. And a lot of these very traditional ways of, of doing or tracking a product. What we're seeing now is a bit more complex solutions. Um, we have one building at Concordium on, on energy, but it's, it's more of in the infrastructure of how one company works, where you don't need to trust that one entity with the information that they have, which is where you can really use a blockchain. So one of the examples, I know energy was, was very high on the list for a lot of you people listening in. One of the examples I wanted to start with, and for anyone who wants to explore this a little bit more, we have lots of YouTubes, you can scan the QR code and learn more about the use case. But this particular one was one of the first ones that we built with Concordium, which is on energy or renewable energy tracking. Um, it's with the Danish National Transmission System Operator. So what is one thing that's really interesting with it, it's, it's actually a public entity that I've chosen to do something on a public blockchain, mm -hmm. which I think is incredible in a sense that you would want to explore new technologies, but you also understand that it can really be used for the traceability element, the immutability element, but also the verification. So imagine that you have the entire Danish national energy grid mm -hmm. with renewable energy being produced on a minute basis, right? And the way we do it today is that you wait a year out, you go back and you look back at all the energy that was being produced and you're like, oh, let's divide that into whoever bought the renewable energy credits. Instead, what this solution is doing there is that it's time stamping on the blockchain yeah. every 15 minutes and every hour of how much renewable energy is being produced. So that means when I buy an energy credit as a company, I can actually prove that it's that specific energy being produced at that specific source. But what's more is that any auditor or any individual who wants to verify that energy credit can actually go in and look at it as well. So that was sort of one of the first ones that we have that was on like the traceability element, but then moving also into renewable energies. And what's interesting, I think what you said amongst not only the complexity of understanding the different types of energy, how to connect a technology grid and allow people to trade real time, is just the, the fundamentals of connectivity, value. This not being a siloed solution that doesn't bring value in the everyday life. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people, when they hear the words ESG and they hear the word technology, they're like, ah, where's the utility of all of this? Yeah, and there's a lot in this case. So one thing is that it's, it's, an, it's an EU first. So it hasn't been done by any of the other TSOs yet. Okay. Um, but I think the interesting thing, again, with Inakina choosing a public blockchain to do it, is that any of the other TSOs around Europe can tap into the same solution. So when you have the energy market that is trading across European borders as well, yep. you won't have the same double counting because the renewable certificate that you're matching up with on the chain, that will only ever be one. So you can only own that one piece, that one element. So that's really one of the, the cases that is interesting within traceability, but I know we have a few more. Yeah. Um, it's, as I mentioned, it's one of the first topics that sort of evolved with technology. And obviously you have IoT as well, you have AI yeah. to do all of the data crunching with it. Um, but we're gonna unfold a bit one of the use cases that I found really, really interesting, which is uh, a project that we're doing with a partner in South Africa called DMA. And what is happening in South Africa is that... Tell us. <laughs> I will tell you. A lot happening in South Africa. Some of you actually have registered from South Africa. So you might be able to recognize some of these things, but they are introducing a carbon tax, which is, which is quite unique. They're mm -hmm. one of the first countries to actually reinforce it that early, although it's been postponed a bit. Um, but they're reducing, introducing a carbon tax, which means that whatever you emit that you don't reduce, you have to offset in terms of not paying taxes. Um, and obviously a lot of companies would want to move into a space where it's actually, it's a business model for them as well. So yep. it's not just doing good for doing good. There's actually a, like a carrot at the end of the stick of, if I do good, I can get tax reductions at the same time as I'm doing something for the planet. And, and you will see in a bit when I introduce Richard to tell us a bit more about the case, but, but what they're trying to do is that they're trying to capture um, carbon. Mm -hmm. which is being emitted when you want to produce fizzy drinks or beers or your okay. sodas. They want Something to... a lot of us can relate to. <laughs> a lot of you can relate to. So all of the little bubbles, or bubbles in a bubble, that okay. is actually something that is being reintroduced. It's, it's food grade carbon that is being reintroduced into the bubbles in order to reduce a company's uh, carbon footprint. 
But how do you prove that? That's really one of the things. It's such an invisible thing that is happening. Like someone is capturing carbon or assets asset carbon from, from a production yep. and you want to cleanse it and put it into production of brews. Fizzy drinks. Yeah. yeah. And no one can really prove what is happening in that chain unless you document it from your sensors, from yeah. the weight scales throughout the production and you put it into something that is distributed and easily accessible for anyone. But that was a very long introduction, but I'm thinking uh, Richard can tell us a bit more about it. Let's hear it. We're not looking necessarily so much in terms of um, carbon credits, we're looking at carbon reduction and, uh, and then looking for the tax efficiencies on the back of that. And I believe that that is going to be a, a, a huge segment. The second thing is we, we, you know, we've looked around industries to say, where, where can we measure um, emissions? You know, there is a, a global shortage of um, beverage grade or food grade um, CO2 and um, you know everyone likes their fizzy drinks at the moment so it's been quite interesting uh, in order to create that a lot of companies have to burn ethanol and then actually take and, and capture um, uh, the CO2 then uh, put that into everyone's fizzy drinks so it's quite an interesting situation we've been looking at um, uh, at, at some ways to measure some of the offtake um, of that so the natural capture and then the scrubbing of that um, and and, uh, and and then the creation of um, beverage grades here too. Just a bit of uh, um, a bit of fun. It's an enormous industry, um, so a lot of data, a lot of different processes in the chain. You know, how does one go from a, um, a fermentation tank all the way to a storage tank, and um, and the process to create that beverage grades here too in that um, in that chain. Lots of data points, lots of different um, iterations, and um, and uh, a really really nice project to put on the blockchain. Yeah, so a really nice project to put on the blockchain. Maybe I can put some words more around why it's such a good thing. Um, yeah, I think one one of the main reasons is that one of the cases that or the case here that that Riches was explaining, a lot of the things is being reused in their own production, which means that the owner of the data and the producer of it actually owns the entire data flow of it. I think one of the things that blockchain can really go in and help with, specifically for auditing purposes, is ensuring that none of that data has been manipulated. So the blockchain can store all of the information. Yeah. It's transparent, it's immutable, and it's coming directly from the source, meaning that no one really had a chance to manipulate any of it. But what is also interesting is that it's going to be such a big industry that they're also now looking into how can you actually do this as a business model. So imagine if you're selling these fizzy bubbles that you want to reintroduce into your drink, you also want to be able to prove to the people that are buying it that it's actually from waste production rather than something that you're distributing or producing for the purpose of earning money on it in the end. So I think that traceability and that track, it's transferable to a lot of different industries. You can see it for like green steel in Europe as well and some of the other industries that are opening up, but that complex production of having one single source of truth is really where I see some of the benefits. What I think is really interesting is that the benefits come to bear when you put money on the table. Yeah. And what's interesting to see, nothing like a good tax legislation and regulation and opportunity for corporates to realize that ESG reporting maybe is no longer, you know, the nice story of just saving the planet, but it could also be part of their operating modus and how they do business. Every part of their production schedule can also be something automated. When we start thinking about this, I keep thinking about where you've seen the evolution of ESG and an understanding of the utility in large corporations. I think that's a super good question. We have, we have another partner um, who, who, will, who we'll listen to in a bit. But it is a really good point of having something that is underutilized in your own business and figuring out a way of repurposing or reusing it downstream in a business model or to a completely different industry. And we've been having lots of conversation with Marcus Carrera from Fujitsu, who obviously Fujitsu works with a lot of global clients. Um, yeah. And for them to really see some of the use cases coming in of doing traceability for these clients, but also allowing them to have a marketplace um, on the backside of it. Um, so let's hear perhaps from Marcus and a bit on the, the water utility case that they have. For example, it's very, uh, we, we create botanical water. Botanical water, is, it was a very amazing project because 
we take the water from some food process. That water was unusable anymore, but we include in, in, the, uh, in this water some data that make usable, like, hey, this, this water taken from some food, some vegetables, is reusable for industrial processes, usable for public, right? And then we associate water credit, but you can make this process if you are not working with blockchain because you want to, you want to, you know, you want transparency, you want immut immutability of the data. And then if you start working with this, then you can, you can create a secondary market. So I think what is really interesting about what he was saying right here is that you figure out a way of reusing some of the data that is already existing to you and some of the business models that you have. And before the event, we got a really interesting question. I'm just scanning through it to figure it out. Um, but mainly the question was around how can you actually figure out a way for businesses to get involved with these new technologies or a green transition? Well, I've, I've, in my experience working with institutions and governments across the globe, it's really hard. Like you, you're first starting to, if you're a large corporation in our discussion with Marcos, you have multiple people in charge of what the benefit or the consequence reputationally could really be for your business. You have the people in charge and responsible for ESG that are out there understanding the different governing bodies, the different steps in where regulation is going to come into place. They're trying to wave the flag of saying, this isn't just doing good for doing good's sake, but this is actually the way we should operate. And you have sometimes like the push and pull between CFOs that are looking at this and saying, great, but where's the money? Where's the return on investment? Or where's my tax credit? Or where's my ability to really move my organization through this transition? And you know, we don't make it easy either because there's not only one technology that is necessary for this to come into place. When we look at the ESG problem more broadly, we're effectively thinking about how to integrate and make sense of information that today lives in different silos. It's audited and captured and stored in different ways. There's different stewardship to that data. So who to trust, how to trust, and, and how to then grab perhaps a big ship. We have wonderful people from all the big fours joining here in the webinar. We have large corporations that operate in different jurisdictions that also have different levels of maturity around this topic. So I think the topic of reutilizing and thinking of your business model as a way of being sustainable requires also a rethinking on your technology and data strategy. Yeah, and I think those two actually go quite well hand in hand. So I remember when like the digital transformation started happening and everyone was like, hiring a digital lead or doing it like yeah. in a small part of the business and you're sure. trying to just do what you did today but with like digital lures and today it's it's been sort of the same for ESG and sustainability so the first step was like okay let's just figure out what we're doing today where are we emitting what does our production look like who's our suppliers and then just trying to do it green yeah and now it's a lot more of like how am I actually a company that sees myself as part of this ecosystem where I'm both getting something from someone that it's you know one man's treasure is another man's treasure mm -hmm. that whole way of thinking I think is something that this ESG and sustainability space is really developing into much more than they have been before it's not really this siloed thing it's a full way of thinking about a business rather than just seeing it as you know a nice to have yeah, but, but even when we think about, Maria, the, the phase and, and y as you said, you know, a lot of people are still sitting there going, hey, I got to do reporting. Yeah. And even on the reporting, you look at the crazy metrics. Let's maybe talk about one of the big hot markets that, you know, when people think of reporting and they think of markets and they think of ESG, they think carbon. Yeah. They think, where's my money, but where is the big carbon market? And what do I do and how do I play in it? You've been in the space for some time. You've seen the evolution. You've, you know, most people sometimes think this is like a silver bullet. Mm. The end all be all. I certainly don't fall under that camp, but one that recognizes the importance and the size. What have you experienced, Maria, in that, you know, the carbon market exploding, people understanding what it is? 
Well, it's been it's been a really huge transition of the carbon market. So obviously there are the two markets. You have the voluntary, you have the mandatory one. And I think for the past two years, the voluntary carbon market has really done huge steps in terms of digitalizing. I have this, when you used to buy offsets before, it was kind of like buying the stars in the sky, right? You would go on a website, you would see a nice picture of a forest. You could also go into a different website and see the same picture of a forest. And then you would just buy the credit from wherever you sort of felt had the most Magical credibility, forest. right? <laughs> and I think really with the carbon markets and the way it's maturing is that you have ESG laws regulations coming in. And that means that people actually now can calculate and measure how much they emit. And I think for a lot of people, it has been like, a, oh, okay, what can I do when the path to reduction takes a lot more years? Maybe I can help refinance some technologies for, for instance, carbon removal, or I can help um, do something for ecosystems that are working with, for instance, forest or forest protection. And in that, you know, there are the good players and there are the bad players. Which is, which is a challenge just in itself, right? Which for is the huge average challenge. corporation to go figure it out. Just this players in the yeah. marketplace. Okay. So we had a lot of conversations with one of the largest uh, forest owner, I think a year back when everyone okay. was sort of figuring out if we were to do carbon credits in a way that would make it easier for companies to know what they're buying. So uh, they obviously had huge land. And every time they were doing a new forest project, some of the big companies would do due diligence on them. But sometimes on a big forest project, they would have nine companies coming to do due diligence. All at different times. At different times. <laughs> and they're just here trying Asking to... Asking different things probably. Exactly. Well. <laughs> and I think that that is really one of the core things that you can do differently with putting on the blockchain and using AI and using satellite images and all of these other in technologies that helps create a bit more transparency and clarity of what you're actually buying. That's one of them. Uh, and then another thing is obviously there are a lot more um, opinions in the market now. So obviously if you've had the big registry and I'm, I'm sure a lot of the companies sitting out there today have maybe been more comfortable buying from some gold standards, various of the world, if they were offsetting. Um, and I think really what's happening now is that anyone who's working with carbon credits from maybe a more data heavy perspective are trying to say, what are the other ways we can work with having uh, these big uh, uh, registries helping us prove that we're doing good in a different way. Um, so that has really been, it's been a crazy market. We have one of the first use cases that uh, I, we brought on here at Concordium within this space uh, called Climify. And I think Tim, he has a great way of explaining it. They're focused very much on nature-based solutions um, around two different things. We can, we can sum it off afterwards, but he has a really good way of explaining what are some of the things that the blockchain industries contribute with um, to the carbon space? So let's hear Tim. We're focused heavily on nature-based solutions, and in particular, uh, two sectors currently, one of which is peatland, um, which is about the restoration of peatland to enable it to move from being a carbon, carbon bomb to becoming a carbon sink, absorbing gigatons of carbon. And the other is in the agri agricultural space, which is regenerative agriculture and carbon removal through our work with the carbon, the, the, sorry, with the hemp carbon standard, um, which is about removing uh, carbon from the atmosphere and then measuring what happens to that removed carbon and making sure it goes into durable, permanent uh, uh, carbon stores over the long term. The reason to use blockchain in the carbon space is primarily because it allows a, a much more accurate representation, um, both in terms of uh, being able to create very accurate baselines, which is extremely important, to measure and to record what those baselines are in a way in which can't be tampered with, and then ongoing in terms of recording uh, monitoring efforts. And finally, uh, most importantly, for the, both the issuance and the retirement of carbon, carbon credits. Uh, and in retirement terms, as I mentioned previously, the aim is to avoid any form of double counting of those credits so that when they are retired, they truly stay there and retired. What a problem, right? Accessibility in, in, in a time where, you know, information distrust mm. couldn't be highest in just society. 
to hear him talk about just the sheer fact of being able to trust something. Yeah. What a transition. How does this, how has the project evolved in the ecosystem, Maria? So we've had, we've had some different projects, even, even Tim and, and Climify, they've been doing, working around two different ways or two different nature-based solutions. One of them is a hemp standard, another one is a peatland standard. And for people out there that don't know what this is, do you want to break it down? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So what um, Peatland, obviously, as he, as he described before, is this land that is sort of like a mushy area. And when it's in a really de degraded state, it actually emits carbon. But oh, wow. when it's wet and mushy, it absorbs twice as much carbon as forests. Um, the thing is what you call re or making the land wet, wet again is such an expensive process. And mm. a lot of the land is owned by individuals. Um, that probably just wanted a really big space <laughs> um, and didn't really consider that this was actually like a huge carbon offsetting or opportunity for them. Wow. So what we've been working with with, with Tim um, is sort of allowing them a platform where they can sell these credits that will help refinance the rewetting of these areas. It's, I don't think it's possible to build the perfect carbon market tool. Yeah. Um, but it is definitely possible to build a tooling that allows anyone who wants to buy them to use all of the data that's coming from Climify. So what they get to see is the satellite images, the measurements from the land that is actually being revetted, the scientific calculations that they've done together with uh, a certifying body in the UK that does it for peatland all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, so you really get trust in that specific carbon credit. And what I think is so amazing with this project is that they really wanted to try to help UK-based entities offset where they emit. So sort of taking responsibility from the area that you're in. Yeah. And it's the- Taking accountability exactly. for your community. I think and it's something super important because it's something we can tangibly yeah. feel. Exactly. And right. I think some of the some of the projects or bigger off tickets that I've been in discussing with, it's been down to a point where companies are now like, I have operations in all of these countries, so I want to help if I have to offset in each of these countries with a given project. And I think that, you know, peatland covers three percent of the earth's surface, so that is like quite durable actually. Yeah, there's um, there's some there's some to pick there's, from. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and nature is incredible, isn't it? Like when we just hear, I think like Humanity somehow forgot to just look around. Yeah. And to hear that the same thing that can cause something can change by just ingenuity and yeah. curiosity shows the potential of technology for me. Exactly. And this conversation that you brought up around, you know, the ability to participate. Not everybody out there is willing and ready. I think some of the big fours have outlined like, I don't know, 400 other players. The ecosystem you've been putting together has been bringing more people than just Climify. I know Akalibri is a project yeah. that has been bringing some innovation in the space as well in Concordium. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so obviously it's, it's building actually, weirdly enough, in the same technology base. What we've tried okay. to give is like an agnostic tool where everything that goes on in the digital MRV, so any of the, the verification standards, all of the reporting that you're doing on the land or whatever that is, that is being uploaded and then you have what we call an on-chain verification where you choose as a project the verification body that serves for the giving area that you're trying to do something in. Okay. So, so the methodology is, is developed, either it's a taken methodology from the UN or it's something that is being developed with a local government for that specific area. So one of the, one of the things which is you just brought up with, with Aquilibra is that they're doing direct air capturing where the methodology is currently being developed and it's, it's on the EU uh, with the Commission and the Parliament as well, trying to figure out what is the right methodology for actually scientifically proving that you have captured, captured. and sequenced it and stored it. Um, so all of that is something that is currently being developed and what we wanted to do was create a platform that can help document all of those efforts for it. Um, we, can, we can listen into a bit on Acrylibra, but our, what I think is really interesting is that direct air capturing is it's a technology in its own. Mm -hmm. So whereas nature is, you need to go and put technology into it to capture all of the information. This is a technology on its own. So how do you put that into a place where it's actually transparent and trusted and all of the data that comes in from the carbon being captured, that that data is actually immutable so you can prove it to auditors. So you have that audit trail. 
but I'm thinking we can hear a bit from Anthony and, and the Acrolibra project on what they've been doing. What we're trying to do is achieve around four different types of uh, new carbon offset uh, projects. Uh, uh, the first of those is, is actually a, a project uh, based in the UK. Uh, it's planning on capturing 10 million tonnes of carbon every year. Uh, and their project is designed uh, around uh, direct air capture of, of pollution uh, and CO2 emissions. Uh, so it has a net, a direct net, net effect, effect on, on the actual climate itself. So it's quite an exciting project because uh, it, you, you can demonstrate physically the, the benefits of, of, of the project uh, and our job is to create the methodology that proves that we, we're scientifically removing the, the carbon from the atmosphere along with I think 12 other greenhouse gases and, and it has a big effect on the population as well because if you can imagine the amount of emissions that we're producing uh, and, and the actual impact on people's health over time, uh, Aqualibra is going to be able to demonstrate on our platform the, the actual net benefit to people's health uh, by capturing this carbon. Not only do are we making the environment a, a better place, but we're also making it a better place for people. He's making a better place for, for us to live. <laughs> for us to live. So it's for the people and the planet. And I, and I actually kind of like what you said that around the, the traceability part of it. Yeah. So to me, you know, capturing carbon, it, even with what Richard was explaining earlier about capturing carbon as well for different purposes, it's, it's, invinci it, it's invisible, right? You can't, you can't really see it. Like if I'm buying it, how can I actually see and trust it? Mm -hmm. And really doing that traceability from the ca capturing all the way through the process of actually storing it is something I think is going to bring a lot more trust to to that area so we don't end up in like a buying the star scenario again correct which i think has been a lot of the fear of a lot of the large corporations even engaging in the space right engaging in the conversation engaging the awareness engaging in saying is this a trustable market yeah. am i going to go out there and get accused of greenwashing i think a lot of what this brings to bear is it can't just be a one-stop solution it has to be an ecosystem it has to have interoperability at its core, which is why what you said is really interesting. It's not one technology that's going to solve this. It's an array of sets of technologies okay. and different governing bodies that are going to have to learn how to talk to each other. Yeah. Exactly. And, and on that, perhaps, because you've had a lot of experience working with governing bodies, I know that you just yeah. came home from a trip to Canada. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious. So as, as an EU-based entity, you know, a lot of the things that I... I experience on a day-to-day -day basis is, is all of the European countries trying to maneuver into what does this new reality of reporting actually look like. But there's a lot of other countries that are going to be affected by it as well. So I'm really curious, what was the discussions on with the Canadian uh, society? Well, I was super privileged to be there in conversations with ministers of finance and defense and, and, and environment, understanding the challenge that they have ahead. You know, they were... They have a lot of public scrutiny today on the information, how they're there as public settings to serve the people and the planet. And I don't need to tell you that, you know, most public jobs have a really hard time just attracting like technical talent. And we just talked about it in this very short period of time. How many technologies, how many different types of governing bodies, like you pretty much need an entire department to try to make sense of it all. Like I think uh, one of the big forces identified over 400 companies in the space and the governments were saying to us, uh, I don't even know where to start. I know that, that I have many things that I have to push for the government, but is this an opportunity? Is the Canadian government forced to is obviously in a massive part of understanding the natural resources that they have? What is the technology infrastructure that I need to have as a country to not only build and protect my natural resources, but to build the right markets for the right incentive structures. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what they were trying to get at me. They were like, you understand about data. Wh what do I do with this? What is the usability of all this information? And how can I make sure this information is not only right, trustable, immutable, but it's useful for my decision making. And I think that is actually what a lot of companies are struggling with. Today. Yeah. So obviously, at least from, from an EU side, you know, we've learned and known that 
these regulations were going to come in. We've had a lot of companies experiencing with doing, you know, the early CSR reports. Now you're trying to do everything yeah. right. And, and when I got into this space, it was really, you know, I had to do an ESG report on my own. I had no experience like six years ago and I was trying to map things together and figuring out the data points. And that was a small Nordic think tank. So I can't even imagine what companies have to go through now. Like you said, it almost takes like a village to do it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that, you know, the data sharing ecosystem. I think we we hinted it in, in maybe the topic of today of like talking about what is actually beyond reporting. What happens, like what is the utility of the data? How are we actually going to put it to use? Because at least a lot of the companies today are SMEs. Yeah. Small companies that are struggling with digitalization for one, but now also have to do reporting on the side. And I've been in contact with a few, you know, that in the same way that the carbon market space would have someone come and do due diligence, you also have bigger corporates setting out uh, these requirements for their suppliers to deliver information and on. Mm -hmm. And obviously you want to be a green supplier and you want to be a compliance supplier in order to get the deals. So how is it actually that you can create this, like give this information back in a way that is audited it's transparent it's immutable they can trust it to me that's such a complex challenge i think that's the problem that's why we haven't evolved in the level that we should like we should all be collectively ashamed of particularly just thinking a one bullet size solution for any of this i think the acknowledgement of even just how we build vernacular, like how do we speak the same language? How do we help a small to medium sized business or a large enterprise that works in different jurisdictions to have a position where they stand on ESG? Like it's, 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 not, it's not a one technology solution, but it's a complex problem of just even understanding. I had a, a recent discussion with the government in Brazil where I'm originally from. And one of the conversations was, you know, where do you even begin now that I have different departments all thinking that their ESG reporting is important, how do I go beyond all yeah. these reports that I now be drowned with? So that's my question to you. How, yeah. how, how do you use tech to drive this beyond, great, I now have an overwhelming amount of information about what I already knew, the world's on fire. I think, you know, I think what a lot of companies have, have at least the ones I've been in contact with, and I know Marcus had the same experience through Feed, so a lot of them are looking for like that silver bullet technology to come in, save us all, and it's just not there. And it should even be there, right? No. I often ask yeah. myself the question, you know, are we trying to, you know, we in the 90s made the world run on software. We build giant monolithic applications of ERP systems that have taken over our information and data security pretty much of the planet. But somehow we all failed at taking care of that same planet. Yeah. So is, the, is this the right answer for why all of this exists, all this tech, all blockchain? I mean, I'm, I'm hoping at least that some of the things that we will be able to build and together with anyone who's, you know, still want, listening, still listening <laughs> and wanting to explore it, I think really what we're learning in this period is that there have been such a huge focus on making data automated right this is why i think a lot of the people that are in the esg reporting space is looking to some of the big fours to help with the automation or some of the manual labor they're looking to some of the big erp systems they're like please come save us and i think that's a good way of getting the data in i don't necessarily believe that it's the best way of making that data useful or shareable so to me i have this you know vision of what esg looks like beyond just reporting and i want to make it as easy for companies to share the fragments of the data that they want i'm dreaming of this like scope 3 ecosystem where data is stored on a blockchain it's immutable it's shielded for the right reasons but then if i want to share something with you i don't have to go out and do give you access to everything and have you do multiple due diligence you can actually just tap into another company's due diligence of it or you can see that it's been audited, it's been verified, and you can get the exact data points that you want. But that's like my utopian world uh, somewhere far into the future. We're curious to know what your utopian world is, if you're still out there sharing some questions. <laughs> yes. And on that, perhaps we should get to the questions just yeah. in, uh, in respect of time. Let me see. <laughs> 
What are some practical steps for businesses to embed blockchain into their existing operations for greater transparency and trust? Ooh, all right. Are we taking a crack at this? I'm, I'm thinking we are. I mean, you had a really good conversation, I know, with Marcus from Fujitsu, who yeah. had a lot, of, uh, a lot of ideas on that. Yeah, well, Marcus was saying, does it all go into the blockchain, right? Is, yeah. this, is this where we start? The answer is probably no. The answer is probably what portions of it. Think about the blockchain or a, you know, a trace path of you being able to then find the right information where it resides. I think the first step is understanding what are you trying to automate and what current data do you have as an entity, as a small business. Maybe it's the information about your clients. Maybe you want to offer them loyalty points and maybe that's how you start to think about how to use or not a technology as powerful and as sort of broad as blockchain and application. Yeah, I think the broad is probably a, a, a very good segment for it. You know, we've had 40 minutes now. We've been trying to give like little, <laughs> little rice cakes on each of the topics. And I think, you know, if you have any questions, please send them in because we would love to unfold each of them in much more depth. Um, at a later point. But yeah, I think that is really one of the things for companies to get started with. It's about daring, I think, yeah. especially on ESG reporting data. It's really about saying, okay, am I bold enough to try and say, if I make this immutable and transparent, because someone is going to come and audit this at the end, can I give that out to the broader public to actually verify some of the information as well? And I think, you know, the Inakinet case that we were explaining in the beginning, what that case can really do is that it can help with some of the scope two emissions in Denmark, proving the actual usage of electricity that you've consumed and that you bought. Um, so I think, you know, it's figuring out what is that little place I wanted to start in. Is there any processes where there are multiple parties involved, where there has to be an audit at some point? and where someone outside of the company, stakeholders, actors in the ecosystem actually want to go in and verify, is that information even correct? I think it's a step towards allowing your position, whatever your position is in yeah. the world, towards a more conscious or environmental or social um, organization. It's so connected to your mission. I often find that like, you know, if you think about blockchain as a way of storing, capturing, and sharing data, you think about data as a way of telling mm -hmm. stories. What story do you want to tell about your business, right? And I think probably uh, Richard's fizzy drink story is one of the ones that really resonates with people. So either you like your sparkling water, your soda water, or your beers, but that is really something, you know, where some of the bigger breweries in the world can really go in and say, okay, I actually have a responsibility, not only on the plastic side, but also on the production side. How can I prove that I am as green as I claim to be? Correct. Should we do one more question before we close it off? We can. Okay. We've had a few, which They're is really actually... exciting. And if you guys still have some, make sure you send them out. Yeah, because we are going to sum these up, obviously, and get back to all of you on them. So it's on the Telegram if you if you want to join there. And we'll see if we can if we can do a different version where we either send it out in another live segment or, or we'll do it. Or we find another. an interactive way for you guys to incorporate an answer next time, maybe. Yes, that would be great. Say, please provide some timeline on developing different blockchain technologies and case study applications. So we've had a few um, <laughs> in this conversation. There's a lot of things building, which I think is probably one of the most interesting things for me, at least to be in this space. So I worked with climate for a bit and I felt like every day something new was happening. And then I put blockchain technology on top of that. And now it's like every hour, something new, interesting is happening in the industry. Um, there are really a lot of different ways to get started at Concordium. We support any project who wants to build either on the ideation part, but also on some of the implementation areas around it. The carbon market, for instance, is a tooling that is somewhat off the shelf. You have to do some of your own developments, but that should take you four to six weeks. So it's really about what are the things that you want to document. A traceability solution is simply writing things to a blockchain and being able to verify it, or is it complex smart contract development where you want people to go in and verify different elements. So it really depends on what you want to build, but it's not, you know, I've been in tech for a while. I used to work with, uh, with IBM on AI and it's not these like massive scale projects. That's really not how I'm experiencing them anymore. I'm seeing a lot more companies just going in and trying to 
do their best of getting some sort of proof of technology out there to see, okay, is there actually something here that is valuable to the planet, to our stakeholders that want to get some information and also to our business? Yeah, and I feel like that's that's the spirit, a spirit of experimentation and being able to just trial out a few things and understanding what we talked about earlier. Like, this isn't an ecosystem. You're not going to find that one silver bullet. Reach out. The market is so humble and understanding that the problem is much bigger than any one of us or any one organization. Exactly. I think with that, we're going to sh- cut it off for today, unfortunately. We would love to hear uh, both a bit about what you thought about the event and the segments today, but also what of the areas that you're mostly interested in us unfolding a little bit more, because there is so much to unbundle, both in terms of how it's built technically, how you work with other uh, companies in this ecosystem as well. But please send in your questions if you have any. The, The channels are still open, so we would love to receive them and we'll get back to you in in just a few weeks time on everything. But with that, we just wanna thank you all for joining in from all over the world. And then specifically, thank you to you, Bianca. It's been really a pleasure to have you here. A pleasure is on mine and hopefully many more to come. Thanks for watching.